half a love never appeal to me if your heart never could yield. welcome to a new edition of the neon jazz interview series with new york city jazz singer marty elkins we talked to her about her latest 2020 cd elk tone music tis autumn and she opened up about this COVID-19 world and her life in music. She was born in Jersey City, New Jersey. And as a child, she listened mostly to the soul stations of New York and the late night R&B shows like Jocko's Rocket Ship. From there, she found jazz and never looked back. Get to know her. Dig this interview. Kansas City is a good music town, I would think. Yeah, I mean, for what I'm doing, for how life has worked out and doing jazz, I don't know that there's, there's probably a couple other cities that would work, but Kansas City is definitely a tasty little place to do some kind of, like, music uh, show like this. So, for sure, yeah, it's mm-hmm. good. So, if, if people are receptive to it, is the club scene good there in Kansas City? Yeah, really it is. Yeah, prior to March, we were in a renaissance, man. I mean, it was just, like, there was clubs that were hopping, cats were playing everywhere. It's a very cooperative and supportive scene. Um, Bobby Watson was in charge of the UMKC program. He retired prior to the pandemic, but he got so many really good cats here and really built a scene where this used to be a springboard big cities like New York, but now people stay. In fact, people are moving to Kansas City. It's, it's really an ideal kind of place. I mean, the, you know, with the cost of living, the amount of clubs, the whole thing, it just makes sense. I think, yeah, I think in any town, any big city or biggish city, there's a jazz scene somewhere, if you, if you look. Yeah. Because yeah, I lived in Boston about. for many years, and when I first got introduced to jazz, I was in college up there, and I found all the jazz musicians to be found up there, I think. Well, I, no one ever finds them all, but I, I met a lot of really great, and, and like old-time ones from, you know, back in the day that were in big bands and things, and guys yeah. who taught at Berkeley, and I met a lot of interesting musicians. I wasn't really singing, and I was just fascinated by the whole jazz thing. Yeah. Yeah, because I, really didn't, I didn't really grow up with jazz. I really grew up, well, I grew, you know, I'm a New Yorker. I grew up, actually, I grew up in Jersey, but I consider myself a New Yorker because I guess when you consider yourself something, that's always risky. <laughs> right. <laughs> we lived right by the tunnel, so, I, you know, my dad worked in New York. We were always in and out of New York, so I really was kind of, you know, that, uh, for some reason, the R&B from that era was really great, so I was always listening to the R&B stations, you know, the top 40, of course, when I was a kid, but I got really into the the, the, old, the really deep, dark R&B stations that were on, like, at one in the morning, I would stay up all night listening to all these crazy shows, like Jocko's Rocket Ship, and, you know, those kinds of shows, and heard all the really, like, cool old R&B, and that's what I really started out listening to, and it was, you know, I was really interested in those singers, like Laverne Baker, and those kind of singers, Bruce Brown. I never really heard, you know, any too many jazz singers. I was going to say, I love that romantic notion of, like, you know, the, the bigger cities had this kind of, like, pirate radio or kind of, like, these underground radio stations. And I saw a movie a while back. I think it was called Pirate Radio. So, mm-hmm. you know, being in radio, I always find a romanticism behind that whole notion because it really did open up a Pandora's box to a lot of people, to music that they wouldn't have, you know, delved into otherwise. And I see a lot of those people as being, like, torchbearers of, like, spreading culture and art for the world, which is awesome. Yeah, I mean, it was for a young kid, you know, that was just like, it was just like it opened the door to, like, this radio land, you know, like, fairyland of fabulous music that you didn't hear in the top 40. Yeah. You heard some, you heard some, but not the real, you know, the real rooty, really swinging stuff, and it was pretty jazzy back then. I mean, the, the pop music, you know, the vocal groups were really, like, they were doing a lot of very good harmonies, and you know, it wasn't just one, four, five all the time. Yeah, well, I guess that would be a place to uh, to start here. I mean, I want to start with the new album, but since we're kind of on this dialogue of growing up, what was the first really big jazz show that you saw, you know, in New York that you thought, man, that's something I would love to do with my life? The biggest show, the music show I can remember, and I'll tell you, I'll go to my deathbed thinking this was the greatest thing I've ever witnessed in my entire life was I saw James Brown at the Apollo wow. in 67. Yeah. Oh, I shouldn't date myself, but oh well. But anyway, <laughs> um, but no, I never saw, actually on a prom date, now that you mention it, I saw Doc Severinsen at Basin Street. Wow. And when they started blowing those horns, I was in the front seat 
front, you know, I was in a you know, ringside table with my date and like another couple, I guess. And I thought I was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> I've never heard of something live like this. Yeah. And I kind of knew who Doc Severinsen was from TV, and I always had sort of a little girl crush on him. Thought he was really cool, and then to see him play live was pretty cool. That was, I guess, that was the first. And 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 he still really is kind of a light in the jazz world. There's a young cat down in Texas, uh, Stockton Helbing, and he's toured with him, and he still gets out on the road. And it's like he just won't stop. He's like the Energizer Bunny for jazz. You know, oh, great. Yeah, well, yeah. He's like one of those 20th century figures. That's yeah. A- up there he's a he's an icon for sure so you have music that came out during a pandemic did you have any reservations about the timing of of something coming out during such a strange time on planet earth well you know we started this before the pandemic hit just before well just before we recorded it in august and uh didn't even know there was going to be a pandemic but i was pretty hopeful because i was doing better a little bit you know with my career in general and and I thought, like, I was getting into better clubs and that, you know, Mike and I could maybe get into some of the better clubs together. But Mike is, like, already, you know, well-known and he can tell you anywhere he wants. But I was actually getting, like, jobs at Nezro, which I never dreamed. I didn't thought I could really get that gig. But I worked there a couple times and to very good houses and, good, you know, good acceptance. And I, I played the 55 bar, which is really kind of a dive bar, but it, somehow it's prestigious. It's it's strange, but it's like really, you know, it's the better people play there, honestly. And so, and I had a great gig, and that was on March 1st, when I knew about the pandemic, and my whole audience knew about it. We're all like, it was kind of like, you know, it was like the gig on the Titanic. I mean, everybody kind of knew that pretty soon we weren't going to be able to go out anymore, and hopefully we weren't going to die. I mean, it was kind of a, not really a pall, but it was like, it was, you know, you can feel it, the people that were the most informed in the room knew that this was not going to be great, you know, pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because when I think about kind of the timeline here, it wasn't really until that second week of March that it was like, all right, it's over with. And I get the feeling, which is the way things happen. Usually the coasts know it before the Midwesterners, of course, everything shut down around the 12th or 13th. And, exactly. and um, you know, I remember seeing Bill Frizzell on March 4th and, at one point, Petra Hayden was singing with the group. She stood up towards the end of the show and started singing, I shall, We Shall Overcome. And the crowd just kind of started all popping up, and we all swayed and sang the song together. And when I think about that and the timing, it was like we all had some preternatural notion, like animals before an earthquake, that something was brewing, you know? Well, um, yeah, I mean, everybody, you know, Mike Richmond and I are close friends. Well, I'll get into that later, but... We talk on the phone quite a bit, and I remember we had a conversation, and I said, Mike, people think this is going to be 14 days when we both start cracked up, you know? I was like, it's going to be years. I mean, really, we, we knew it, but, you know, we, maybe it was prescient, but, I mean, if you just think about a pandemic and how fast it was spreading, it was absurd to think that it would be two weeks and be like, you know, go away. You know, I think now that I've had enough time after this, you know, because that's kind of the, what happened here. I have young kids that are in school, and it was like, all right, we're going to take this week off before spring break. We're going to take spring break off. We'll come back like two weeks later. Let's see what happens. And everything kept getting pushed back. And then they canceled the year. And then everything kind of got canceled after that. So I think everybody was trying to figure out what was going on. But I think it's shock. I think everybody immediately went into trauma. And I think there was a level of denial that went into it. It almost reminds I me of when yes. Yeah. You know, it was like when JFK got shot. Like, you know, Jacqueline, like, ran, like, crawled out of the back of the motorcade. Yeah, in shock, and that's what all of us have been doing since. You know, mm-hmm. we're all trying to, like, I don't know, trying to still get our bearings because I think there was a lot of people that thought this was going to be a blip on the radar, but this is a way of life. There isn't like, oh, well, let's go back to the way things were. There's no way things were anymore. I mean, we are in a, this is life, you know? Yeah, I know. Well, I, ho- well, I don't know, Joe, if it will be life, life like it is now. I, it'll, right, right. It'll, it'll be you know, like, there was a two-year pandemic back in, you know, 1917, 18, 19, whatever, 18, 19, I think. And, uh, you know, it went away. I mean, people were dying. But it wasn't, it wasn't so, you know, the world wasn't so mobile. And I don't know, it's just more, it's just circulating faster than we can imagine. But Yeah. Anyway, the two things, that the week uh, after the 1st of March, which my gig was, 
The 6th of March was these two guys. I don't know if you know. You know who Jerry Weldon is? He plays with uh, Harry Connick quite a bit. Yeah, I do. He, yeah, he's a tenor player. And he's got this partner, John Tindy, who's not like, who's a fabulous saxophone player. Well, he doesn't do much, you know, actively with the jazz world, but he's one of the better saxophone players. And they do it act together. It's so entertaining. And I was living for it. And they had a gig in my neighborhood every Friday. And, like, every Friday I was, like, there. And I, I don't even go to people's gigs usually. I don't even go out. I mean, a lot of times New Yorkers don't even leave their apartments if they have a nice apartment kind of thing. But, I mean, I was dying to go on Friday. I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. And, yeah, that was canceled. And then also there's a Monday night gig at this place, Arthur's Tavern down. It's, like, one of the oldest country probably besides the Village Vanguard. It's, like, in this little area where there's, like, 55 bar, Mesro Smalls. Arthur's, the Vanguard. This is this nice little, like this little Bermuda Triangle of really cool clubs. And I was sitting in every Monday night with this band. Of, it was a Dixieland band, kind of like a trad. I don't know. I don't think they like Dixieland's name, but trad jazz, whatever. They do classic jazz. It's fantastic. But the guys in the band were octogenarians mostly. Not every one of them, but there were like three or four of them that were over 80. And they were like, well, let's we'll still go to the gig. And I'm like, no. Don't go to the gig. And so when that gig was shut down, I was so relieved because I was afraid, you know, like so, because we didn't know I was terrified. Yeah, and I think I, the last gig that I had the chance to go to was all the way on March 14th. And I had, well, even the 13th, I even bowed out of that. So there was two shows that I was going to cover, and I was like, yeah, it isn't going to happen. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, how you kind of got into the jazz scene. How, how did all this start and kind of ramp up for you in the beginning? I guess it started when I got the, the Billie Holiday record in Woolworths when I lived in Boston. I just picked up a Billie Holiday record, Lady in Satin. And, I mean, I had heard a little bit, you know, here and there. You know, I was aware of Ella Fitzgerald. And, you know, I really wasn't, didn't know much about it. But this record was like, I wanted to come, like a few days of complete shock. And then, uh, I don't know if it was actually Lady in Satin. I think it was the, the Billie Holiday record with uh, Teddy Wilson, now that I actually think of it. But the Lady in Satin record just was my favorite one ever. It's, want to be buried with them. I just got crazy with like uh, the Billie Holiday records and Bessie Smith records and I just listened and listened and listened and I started to go around seeing, you know, guys play jazz. I mean, there was like jazz in the hotels in Boston, actually. Dave McKenna was playing in the lounge in Copley Plaza, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, I just would go and hang out and sing with Dave. You know, he let me sing with him because he was such a sweetheart. I remember coming in with sheet music, like, "Hi, oh, can you, can I, could you sing these?" And he was like, so sweet. I mean, he didn't go like, "Get out of here with that sheet music!" <laughs> I know yeah. fifty thousand too. It's like, oh, let me see, baby. Well, I'm not really a good reader. Let's, 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 let's what do you like to sing? And then they say, I'd say, and, they, and I say, well, what key I would know? He said, well, just start singing, baby. Just start singing. A, you know, he'd play in D, anything. You know, because he was such a genius. But I guess I started singing with him, and then I started really thinking, like, hey, maybe I can do this. You know, like, check things out here. So I started getting to know. Between him, I got to know some musicians and a lot of some of the faculty at Berkeley and stuff like that. So I was being more and more aware of jazz and was totally a wannabe up there. I never worked a gig up there ever. And then I came to New York. And, you know, New York is not the kind of place where you come because you want to get into something. You know, it's usually if you come here, you're good at it already. Who are, who are the best at, like, you know, their hometown, come here to, like, you know, get into the jazz scene. But anyway, I just was running around sitting in places, and then I, I sang at a place, and the bass player, this guy, um, Johnny, oh, my God, oh, like, his last name is escaping me. How terrible. And he played with Billy Holiday, too. It'll come back to me. But anyway, he said, yeah. why don't you go over to Jimmy Ryan's and sit, sit in there? Because Max Kaminsky's got a band there, and he lets singers sit in. And, you know, he said, you know, you got something with your singing. I think you, you should do that. So I went there, and I sat in with the band. And actually, one of those guys who I was in the band, Max Kaminsky's band, was uh, one of the guys I mentioned that who's in his 80s now. <laughs> That's mm. at Arthur's I was so worried about. Anyway, he was in his 40s then. And I sat in, and the club owner really liked me. And, he, and Max used to like to get off the bandstand so he could sell his book. So he would have, you know, if he had liked a singer. There was another singer he would have all the time. And so it was she and and I both were, like, allowed to sit in with the band for like a couple of tunes a night. Several of us, she wasn't there, would get to sing a couple of sets. And the club owner started paying me a few bucks. So 
that was good. And then I started, you know, getting little gigs here and there. And went from there. What do you like the best about being a performer? The flow you have when you're doing it. The camaraderie with the band, and like it's just like you become a unit, and it's just such a when it's working really well. It's it's just a, an experience that I'm I'm very happy in that environment. When we do return to live music, when COVID nineteen you know ramps down and people start getting back out, what do you hope we all collectively, musician and audience, realizes about this time away from live music? I think maybe people will come to realize that recordings are all well and good, but there's nothing like live performing. Honestly, I think I sing better. I mean, I've I taped myself at live gigs, and, you know, like, lately, I like what I'm hearing. I mean, when I started, I used to, my blood would run cold, but <laughs> now, you know, I like my singing live better than I, you know, the singing in the studio is, you know, you, you, it's a different feeling in the studio. You feel like you, you know, everything you sing is going to be recorded for posterity, and it's going to be the same every single time, and it's pretty unforgiving, actually. It is and it isn't, because... Everyone is, like, engineering things to pieces and fixing things and, you know, moving the, a part of a chorus and sticking in another part of a chorus. Well, I think people always did that, but they just did it with splicing tape back in the day. But, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do in a studio. And, you know, out in the live gig, people are seeing the real deal. They yeah. feel this is more even and fair. And, you know, I remember back in the day, I used to, for the hell of it, I used to watch that show, Shanana. Remember? It was, like, awful. They were awful. And it was really yeah. entertaining. And, you know, I really had to get a big kick out of it. And then they went and taped everything, and everything was pre-recorded and fixed. And then it sucked. It was so yeah. good anymore. <laughs> so I feel Absolutely. like, you know, life performing is like people who see the real, you know, and this immediacy of, you know, and, and you also have the connection with the audience that you don't have in the studio. True. I guess some of the old pros like Frank Sinatra and those people used to have an audience in the studio back then, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was done much differently, for sure. So everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but you're the one that's living your life. Who do you think you are? Wow, what a question. <laughs> <laughs> After all these years of therapy, let's see, who am I? Um, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm like, actually, one of the guys that used to work at a wedding, uh, we used to do like jazz weddings, very, very few of them, but they were always a blast. And he used to call me the undiva, so... I'm like a, just a person that just likes to sing, and I don't, I don't think of myself as, you know, I don't really expect to be a um, famous star or anything, and even if I became one, I probably wouldn't feel like one. I mean, I, at this point, I don't know if it would ever be that, but, uh, you know, just I just feel like a musical person that, uh, I'm like a fun-loving kind of person, so it's just... I could have been more serious about my life, actually, over the years, and I might have done better, but I think I did okay. You know, I just uh, honestly feel like I'm here to have fun, and that's kind of my, my aim. Beautiful. It's a great answer. Great way to wrap everything up. Thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz today. I appreciate it. All right. It's nice talking to you, and hopefully someday I'll come back to Kansas City and we'll meet. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest singers and players in Boston, New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Marty for her time and class. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. No. Nothing at all. Neon Jazz.